Hello there, Commonwealth. On September 23rd, 2024, thanks to Nintendo, I arrived in Kyoto to celebrate the 135th birthday. A history that is finally being told in the official Nintendo Museum, south of the city, with cafe and store. At the same time, this is also a commemoration to the late Jason Dameron, including with the final new recording, never used before. <laughs> Nintendo history can be traced back to Usajiro Fukui, eventually adopted by Naoshichi Yamauchi. On September 23, 1889, he founded Nintendo Kopai, or Leave Luck to Heaven cards. Thanks to Yamauchi's eye for quality and detail, the popularity of Hanafuda exploded. No wonder why it is such a big part of the Nintendo Museum, both when it comes to playing and painting your own cards. But as I'm not much of an artist myself, it ended up like this. Luckily, they have tools to make it look proper. With that said, Hanafuda allowed Nintendo to thrive in its first 50 years. There was only one problem. Fusajiro failed to give birth to a son. After 40 years as company president, Fusajiro resigned and handed control over to his daughter Tei's husband. Sekirio Kaneda after adopting him into the Yamauchi family. In 1947, the company was reorganized to Yamauchi Nintendo and Company. Unfortunately for Sekirio, he would not witness the effects of his genius business move as he suffered a stroke in 1949 and handed control over to his grandson. Yamauchi Nintendo and Company was renamed to Nintendo Playing Card Company, and by the end of the 1950s, Hiroshi oversaw the long-awaited opening of the new headquarters in Kyoto. Nintendo Playing Card Company became Nintendo Company Limited, and what followed was a long line of experiments with mixed results. But luckily, there was potential in toy making and launched the company's first toy, Rabbit Coaster, in 1965. The same year, Gunpei Yokoi joined Nintendo. Yokoi was quickly promoted in 1966 after Yamauchi caught the eye of an extended arm-grabbing device that the young electrical engineer had developed for his own enjoyment. Where Yokoi saw a tool for amusement, Yamauchi saw big profits and made the Ultra Hand the big holiday push from Nintendo. The success of the Ultra Hand turned Yokoi into a key figure in Nintendo's development and research division. And at the Nintendo Museum, you can try the beam gun and scope experience he created next. For the SP version, I had to do the Turkish Olympic meet. <laughs> other Nintendo toys before Mark, like the mentioned Ultra Hand. Ultra Baseball Machine, hitting stuff is fun. And Love Tester from the 60s and 70s. Nintendo's drive into the video game market would quickly gain pace with their first developed home console color TV Game 6 and Hiroshi Yamauchi's hiring of Shigeru Miyamoto as a new concept artist for Nintendo. Miyamoto was in full swing and would soon contribute with characters to titles such as Sheriff and Space Firebird and then work on the hardware itself for Radar Scope to the handheld video game series Game & Watch. Another successful invention delivered by Gunpei Yokoi and launched with its first game, Ball, in Japan in 1980. In addition, in the first half of 1981, Yamauchi and Nintendo's leadership in Kyoto 
were busy striking a deal with Uwe Bergsten from Swedish company Bergsala to begin distribution of the game and watch to the Nordic market. Meanwhile, back in Japan, Miyamoto and Yokoi were busy with the success of the Raider Scope. First, they targeted the Popeye license. By refusal, they remade the game and characters. Ludo became Donkey Kong, while Olive Oil and Popeye became Pauline and Mario slash Jumpman. The latter two, named after two humans tied to a Seattle warehouse, Nintendo was renting. And just like that, the first platformer was born. Donkey Kong, despite a US court battle, was a success. And President Yamauchi saw potential in expanding to the console cartridge market. In 1983, the Famicom saw its debut in Japan with a very special game, Mario Brothers. At the same time, Atari caused the video game crash in America and granted Nintendo the opportunity of a lifetime. But it also required the Nintendo Entertainment System to be launched as a toy with Rob and Gyromite that would soon allow Nintendo to take the continent by storm. Thanks to Shigeru Miyamoto's, Takashi Tezuka's and Koji Kondo's next game, Super Mario Bros. The most impactful game of all time. Even so, Shigeru Miyamoto was planning to turn his childhood experiences of exploring the beautiful fields, forests, and caves of the Kyoto Prefecture into Nintendo's next system selling franchise. A new team wasn't necessary, as Miyamoto already had Takashi Tezuka and Koji Kondo to both design the world and compose the soundtrack for what would become The Legend of Zelda. Launched in Japan in February 1986, it is dangerous to go alone. Take this. The Legend of Zelda went beyond Super Mario Brothers, allowing for exploration, item-based combat, and puzzle solving. At the Nintendo Museum, you can play these classics in a gigantic fashion. I tried Donkey Kong, Mario, on the oversized Famicom control. Definitely a challenge, but a great activity for couples, friends, or people in the industry. We had a lot of laughs, that's for sure. 1986 also saw the launch of Kid Icarus, and more importantly, Gunpei Yokoi's Metroid. Sequels to Super Mario and Zelda followed in 1986 and 1987, but there were also other franchises like Balloon Fight, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, and Excite Bike, to name a few. Super Mario Bros. 3 launched in Japan in October 1988. In the turn of 1988 to 1989, Nintendo had a firm grip on the console market, but could they also dominate handhelds? As it turned out, Gunpei Yokoi never rested on his laurels, and since 1984, were working on a portable version of the 8-bit Famicom. After the launch of the Game Boy with Super Mario Land in Japan, Nintendo also had another ace up their sleeve, a little pack-in Soviet-Russian game named Tetris. The Game Boy would receive additional new entries, Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins, which introduced a whole new series, Wario, The Legend of Zelda, Link's Awakening, Gunpei Yokoi's Metroid 2, Return of Samus, and the brand new IP, Kirby's Dream Land. Kirby was created by the genius game developers Masahiro Sakurai and Satoru Iwata of the Tokyo-based HAL Laboratory, which Nintendo acquired in 1991 and was named after the ace attorney who had defended Nintendo in the famous Donkey Kong King Kong lawsuit. By 1989, Nintendo's 100th anniversary, a 16-bit successor was required to fight off the new challenger from Sega, Mega Drive slash Genesis. The answer was the Super Famicom slash Super Nintendo. And with a superior controller, better and deeper color variety, and a next-level sound chip from Sony, Nintendo had additionally one secret weapon, games. As the first half of the 90s saw hit after hit. Starting with, in 90, Super Mario World and the brand new Pilot Wings and F-Zero. 91, Zelda, A Link to the Past. 92, the new IP Super Mario Kart. Same case in 93 with Miyamoto's Star Fox. 94 saw Super Metroid. Rare is Donkey Kong Country and Square Enix's Final Fantasy VI. 95, Donkey Kong Country 2, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, and Chrono Trigger. And 96, Donkey Kong Country 3, Super Mario RPG, and Kirby Superstar. It goes without saying, Nintendo destroyed Sega with their lineup. 
and the Game Boy continued to make even more money. And that was needed as Gunpei Yokoi's final hardware, the Virtual Boy, failed miserably, and Yokoi shortly after left Nintendo. He tragically died in a highway accident in 1997. But Nintendo had bigger problems, as after a fallout with Nintendo, Sony launched a 32-bit PlayStation in 1994, and it would take until 1996 for Nintendo to succeed the Super of the Nintendo 64, more powerful than the PlayStation, while betting hard on cartridges instead of CDs. At the Nintendo Museum, both the Super Nintendo and the Nintendo 64 can be played gigantically like the Famicom, and just like in the case of the first big home console of Nintendo, management is key on these later controllers with far more buttons. Just trust me. Which brings us to the cartridge classics. The big jump to 3D with Super Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, and multiple new IPs along with follow-ups to classics. Mario Kart 64, Mario Party 1, 2, and 3, Paper Mario, Star Fox 64, Zelda Ocarina of Time, the highest rated game of all time, the sequel, Majora's Mask, and of course, Masahiro Sakurai's Super Smash Bros. Still, things would have been worse without the British second party of Nintendo, Rareware, and their exclusives, as Blast Core, Jet Force Gemini, Goldeneye, Diddy Kong Racing, Banjo Kazooie and Tui, Perfect Dark, and Conker's Bad Fur Day were very important to prevent droughts on the Nintendo 64. As after the PlayStation dominance in this generation, Nintendo would only face stiffer competition as Microsoft entered with Xbox and almost immediately snatched Rareware with their N64 and NES IPs away from Nintendo. Not only that, the GameCube liked the Super Mario game at launch, as Shigeru Miyamoto's last new IP, Pikmin, and Luigi's Mansion stole the stage. But luckily, they also had Super Smash Bros. Melee, and in the West, the brand new Animal Crossing, which had previously debuted on the N64 in Japan. And of course, they still had the Game Boy Color and Advance, and the handheld business would keep on getting more important. You see, while the N64 hit store shelves, partially owned by Nintendo, Tokyo-based Pokemon and Game Freak took the gaming and then the actual world by storm with their card games, TV shows, and merchandising around the world, generation after generation. Nintendo might have needed a mainline Pokemon on both the N64 and GameCube, but those systems would only receive spin-offs. Stadium, Snap, and Colosseum. More games followed in 2002 after Hiroshi Amauchi stepped down as president in favor of Satori Watt. Just in time before the launch of Super Mario Sunshine, Mario Party 4, Zelda The Wind Waker, and Metroid Prime from Nintendo's newest US first party, Retro Studios. We also had Mario Kart Double Dash, Kirby Air Ride, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, More Mario Party, Pikmin, and Metroid Prime. Still, the system ended up at third place, but Nintendo had a plan for the next generation. First, by hiring Reggie fils as Chief of Nintendo of America and turning him and President Santori Iwata into presentation superstars. Their debut together marked also the reveal of the Game Boy successor, the DS, the first dual screen Nintendo system since the Game & Watch, and what will become Nintendo's instant hit. All thanks to Pokemon and reinvented classics such as New Super Mario Bros. and Mario Kart DS, but also some more casual experiences. You know, Nintendogs, Brain Age, and Animal Crossing. But the biggest strike of genius were the multiple improved versions of the system. DS Lite and DSi all catered to casual gamers. Nintendo had found a new market, but could they balance hardcore with casuals? Yes, as the next console, the motion controlled revolution, Wii, would launch with the most mature Zelda yet. The latter one was naturally revealed in that same 2004 presentation as the DS. Even so, the Wii had to wait to launch until 2006, but when it first was out, it was bundled with Wii Sports, and its other launch title was Twilight Princess. A very solid combo, there was absolutely nothing stopping Nintendo from reclaiming the TV console crown, and they kept that dominance with Super Mario Galaxy, Super Smash Bros Brawl, Mario Kart Wii, the new IP Wii Fit, 
the far superior follow-up to the bundle title Wii Sports Resort, Super Mario Galaxy 2, Zelda Skyward Sword, Super Paper Mario and much more. And this explains why the last of the giant systems to play around in the Nintendo Museum is my favorite out of the bunch. A giant motion controlled Wii. Probably the most hilarious out of all the oversized systems. E3 2010 had the reveal of the 3DS and its price was definitely alright. But Zelda's Crown 35th anniversary at E3 2011 was unfortunately overshadowed by the reveal of the Wii U. Or for most people, conf Fusion. And it was all due to not showing off the new console properly, but emphasizing the new screen or gamepad. As a result, many saw it as just an add-on to the Wii. It also didn't help that 2012's Nintendo Land was not Wii Sports, and though New Super Mario Bros. U managed to convince some, including at Nintendo's final E3 live press conference, this was a system that not even the iconic at this point Reggie could say. In 2013, profits plummeted and President Satori Wata took a major pay cut as the great icon, former president Hiroshi Yamauchi, passed away. That year, along with 2014, 2015 and even early 2016, were the Dark Ages, despite some big new games. Pikmin 3, Super Mario 3D World, Mario Kart 8 and Super Smash Bros for Wii U with Amiibo and the first Nintendo. DLC. All of them couldn't meet financial expectations as the Wii U simply wouldn't sell. And the marketing strategy of the system didn't help. The only thing that kept cancerous President Iwata somewhat hopeful was the mobile and successor NX plans, a new theme park and movie deal with Universal, and as always Nintendo's handheld, the 3DS, where Mario Kart 7, Super Mario 3D Land, Animal Crossing New Leaf, Pokemon X and Y and Super Smash Bros for 3DS were selling well, and the 3DS XL had a successful launch year, which was crowned with a link between worlds, but in addition, the 2DS and new 3DS also helped Nintendo in this dark age. There was some hope left for the Wii U in 2015, which now depended on the new franchise Splatoon, and it did surprisingly well. But after E3 2015, only a successful console successor could turn things around. But this one would sadly never be witnessed by President Iwata, who passed away this same summer. Enter Tatsumi Kimishima, who had one goal in mind, realize Iwata's dream and then hand the presidential title over to someone young. First, he oversaw Super Mario Maker, but all depended on the NX. The last hope, and both President Kimishima and NOA President Reggie Fisama knew it. They would go all in and merge their handheld and TV console businesses. 2016, after Miyamoto's last attempt as producer for Star Fox Zero, will be marked by big reveals. First, of Eiji Anumas and Hidemaru Fujibayashi's Zelda Breath of the Wild, and then by Yoshiaki Koizumi's Nintendo Switch. So in between, a summer miracle happened. Pokemon Go, the smartphone gamble that paid off. But before we get into the final chapter, let's go over Shigeru Miyamoto's favorite western food, hamburgers. As demonstrated by him multiple times at E3 with In-N-Out Burger, but also when talking about Super Mario Run for smartphones in 2016, he must really love them. As the museum cafe, Athena Burger has 270,000 combinations. Well, I went for the following combination. And it was absolute delicious. And now I understand why he stepped down from the role as producer for both Mario and Zelda. All to provide us after the pandemic, Super Nintendo World, the Mario movie, and soon to be Zelda movie, plus museum for Nintendo's 135th anniversary. And he has done a good job as this cafe is both a cafeteria and a more elegant establishment. As a Zelda fan, I naturally admire the Wind Waker stained glass, plus leather seat, while rechargeable burger, time for the current golden age. Initiated on October 20th, 2016 with the first look trailer of the Nintendo Switch. The debut of Nintendo's TV slash handheld hybrid system with an HD display and two Joy-Cons with advanced motion controls. 
demonstrated very clearly by Yoshiaki Koizumi in the 2017 Nintendo Switch presentation. But what also helped was a far more professional marketing campaign and the most incredible launch year ever. The open air of Breath of the Wild, eventually winning Game of the Year and launching DLC the same month. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe becoming the best-selling game of the system. We also got a new IP that year in ARMS. Splatoon 2 alongside the more open Super Mario Odyssey, which had a massive launch in New York. And to end it all off, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 in December. At the same time, the 3DS got its final fill with both Metroid Samus Returns, but a new team at Mercury Steam, and once again Pokemon with Ultra Sun and Moon. 2018 after Labo marked the step down of Tatsumi Kimishima in favor of Shuntara Furukawa, the current president of Nintendo. This year, despite paid Switch Online, did also have Pokemon Let's Go and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate before 2019 made history. First, with new Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe before Reggie decided to leave on top and allow Bowser to take over, a reign introduced by Super Mario Maker 2, and then by bringing Fire Emblem, 2D Zelda and Luigi's Mansion back to TV. But what really mattered was overseeing the debut of a mainline Pokemon generation on a Nintendo HD system. But it wasn't just for the hybrid, as the handheld Nintendo Switch Lite debuted, while Super Mario Party and the new IP Ring Fit Adventure and Super Mario Party. 2020 was all about Animal Crossing New Horizons, the best-selling brand new Switch game. But in 2021, after the opening of Super Nintendo World, it was time for the first new Pokemon Snap, a universally well-received new Metroid in a long time. Mercury Steam, delivering a classic, just in time for the Nintendo Switch OLED model launch. Mario Party Superstars was also solid, while Bowser's Fury showed us the potential of future Mario games. 2022 was again packed, with the first official Nintendo stores in Japan, that being Tokyo and Osaka, a bigger and better Switch Online, Pokemon Legends Arceus, Kirby and the Forgotten Land, Nintendo Switch Sports, Xenoblade Chronicles 3, Splatoon 3, Bayonetta 3, and Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. No wonder Zelda Tears of the Kingdom was saved for 2023, together with Super Mario Bros. Wonder to repeat the mainline Mario and Zelda Thunder from 2017 and the opening of the Nintendo Store, where it all began in Kyoto. Plus naturally, Fire Emblem Engage, the return of Super Mario RPG, and Pikmin 4. Speaking of 4, we have reached 2024, the opening of this museum, and Donkey Kong expansion to Super Nintendo World, in Universal Studios Japan. The former, that being the museum with a shop, where my wallet says stop. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. And there's too much exclusive here to hold back. But on the game front, we had real girl power this year. Princess Peach Showtime and the far better Zelda Echoes of Wisdom. And still, after the upload of this video, Super Mario Party Jamboree and Mario and Luigi Brothership. But perhaps before these, the reveal of the Switch success. 2025 also looks lovely with the launch of the Switch 2, Metroid Prime 4 Beyond, and likely a new 3D Mario or Mario Kart. Or perhaps both. And just like that, we are at the exit of this combined Nintendo history and museum tour. Anyway, a big thanks to Nintendo for inviting and covering my trip to Japan, and to all of you who have been supporting me over the years and have made this trip and video possible. But most of all, a big thanks for everything to Jason Dameron over the years, from the beginning of 2016 until 2023. Anyway, if you haven't already, then be sure to leave a like, subscribe and press the notification.